Hi, it's Dr. Robert Seichert with episode number 22 of the Doctor Podcast Show. Thanks for tuning and watching again. We hope you enjoy these programs, and if you do, please press on the subscribe button. And if you like the episode, please click on the like or repost uh, button as well. Today, I'm really pleased to have as our guest here, Dr. Sarah Fishman. Dr. Fishman is a board-certified internal medicine doctor as well as an endocrinologist. Dr. Fishman is also um, a professor of uh, internal medicine and endocrinology at the Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York City, as well as an attending physician at the Lenox Hill Hospital, which is part of Northwell Health in New York City as well. Sarah, thanks very much for coming today. We really appreciate it. I know you've got You're a welcome. really busy schedule, so I appreciate uh, your taking the time to come here and talk. Thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, one of the hottest topics these days. It's on the news every day. Every place I read about it is diabetes. There, there is an epidemic of diabetes in the USA and around the world. Uh, can you tell us what diabetes is, what the different types of diabetes there are, and sure. why is there an epidemic? Yeah, so there definitely is an epidemic. There's about 38 million Americans living with diabetes, uh, predominantly type 2 diabetes. So about 90 to 95% of Americans with diabetes are living with type 2 diabetes. Uh, the remaining uh, di uh, people living with diabetes uh, typically have type 1 diabetes. Mm -hmm. So those are going to be the two most common types of diabetes. There are some other lesser uh, known types of diabetes. There's a type of diabetes that women may develop uh, during pregnancy called gestational diabetes. Right. Typically that resolves with uh, delivery of the baby. Um, there are some genetic forms of diabetes. There's diabetes associated with cystic fibrosis and some other conditions. But typically when we refer to patients as having diabetes, we're referring to either type one or type two diabetes. Right. So, type two is the more common one. That occurs in people as they age and as they put on weight. Is that, is that right? That's right. So, so there's definitely more of a prevalence of type two diabetes. It's about 90% uh, of people, 90 to 95% of people living with diabetes do have type two diabetes. Type one diabetes is also known as juvenile diabetes because it does typically present in childhood although it can present really at any age, and more and more often we're seeing uh, individuals diagnosed in their teen years or even in their, in their early 20s. Um, so type one diabetes is an autoimmune condition. Uh, the patient has antibodies that instead of attacking bacteria and viruses, turn on the patient themselves and specifically turn on the pancreas and destroy cells in the pancreas that make insulin. And it's not really well understood why this happens. Um, there is a genetic component to it. There is various theories about what triggers this reaction in, in susceptible individuals. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have great treatments at the moment for prevention um, or for eliminating type 1 diabetes once it's occurred. Uh, the only treatment for type 1 diabetes that's been effective is the use of insulin. Um, because type 1 diabetes um, eliminates pancreatic production of insulin. So without insulin, you can't live. Um, and so those, those individuals do require insulin. Type and, two, yeah. Yeah, diabetes, by the way, that's, that's an abnormal metabolism of, of sugar or glucose in the body, is, is that That's right? right. So uh, diabetes actually comes from a, a Greek word. The full name is uh, diabetes mellitus, which means uh, to pour out sweets because it used to be diagnosed by looking at the urine of individuals with diabetes, and um, ants would, would um, you know, kind of congregate around, preferentially around the urine of individuals with diabetes. Really? Because they had sugar in the urine. Mm -hmm. And so that's why back in, you know, in ancient days, uh, the Greeks named this condition diabetes mellitus, meaning to pour out sugar because they had extra sugar in, the, in their urine. So and this he, has been around for centuries. It's centuries, not, It's not yes. a new disease. Definitely not a new disease. There's uh, um, evidence in uh, ancient Egyptians of having had actually type 2 diabetes, and certainly type 1 diabetes has been you know, around for ages. So, um, so type 2 diabetes is definitely the more prevalent type of diabetes uh, at this time and in our country. And type 2 diabetes is not a failure to make insulin, but it's an inability of the, body, of the body to really use the insulin that's being produced effectively. 
So cells need insulin in order to process sugar and specifically to turn the sugar into energy. The sugar needs to get into the cell. And insulin is what allows the sugar to enter cells and then be metabolized into energy. Um, so without insulin, the sugar, the sugar can't get in. When you have type 2 diabetes, your body still makes plenty of insulin. In fact, some, some would say it makes too much insulin. Um, but the cells don't respond to the insulin accordingly. So we call that insulin resistance. So it takes higher and higher levels of insulin in order to get the cells to open up and let the, the glucose in, the sugar in, so it can be metabolized. Um, so typically, individuals with type 2 diabetes don't need insulin in order to treat their disease. They can use other uh, medications that will help lower the insulin resistance and basically reset those cells to be more susceptible to the insulin that our bodies make uh, natively. Right, so now if the glucose and sugar can't get into the cell, then it increases in your blood. It exactly. just floats around in your blood. It floats around in your blood. And that causes yep. a high blood sugar, basically. That causes, right, the, the sugar to stick around in your blood, and when it sticks around in your blood, it can add on to other tissues in your body, such as your nerves or your muscles, and interfere with the way they work. So one complication of diabetes is called neuropathy, um, and that's where glucose molecules actually attach to the nerve fibers and don't allow those nerve fibers to conduct electricity and, and interfere with how the nerves work. So patients with this complication, they don't feel properly things in their feet. They report having numbness and tingling, or they can't feel when they step on, on objects that are sharp because the nerves aren't conducting those signals properly because of the glucose attached to the nerves. So, so they can get sores and infections in their feet exactly. and ulcers. So, and, and that's yeah. why you hear sometimes diabetes have am, patients with diabetes have amputations of their feet and legs. Yep, due to sores that they don't feel that then become infected and, and lead to all sorts of complications. Um, another kind of well-known complication of diabetes is something called diabetic retinopathy. Um, right. And that's a problem with the eyes where certain parts of the eye, uh, you know, again, when sugar molecules, glucose molecules attach to them, they can't function properly, and that can lead to blurry vision, and if untreated, can lead to blindness. Right, yeah, in the eye, I know, so, as an ophthalmologist, I see patients with uh, diabetes not control well, it damages the blood vessels inside the eye and causes yeah. uh, bleeding in the eye. What about the heart? Uh, it's, it's known that people who have diabetes that's not control well, uh, have an increased risk of heart attacks and also strokes. Yep. Why is that? Absolutely. Well, that's because uh, patients with type 2 diabetes um, typically will, ha will develop atherosclerotic disease, so they'll get a lot of buildup of plaque in the vessels around their heart, um, and the sugar can lead to a lot of, inf the high sugar levels can lead to a lot of inflammation, which stabilizes those plaques and increases their, the, their narrowing of the blood cells doesn't allow to blood to pass through, and that's what leads to the strokes and the, and the heart attacks. Right, so why is there an epidemic of type 2 diabetes? Yeah, that's a great question. I think a lot of it has to do with some of our lifestyle choices. Since the Industrial Revolution, when we've been less active, um, also the, available, the availability and the, the low cost of processed foods. Mm. Um, so adding you know, fruit, high fructose corn syrup to foods, uh, the use of condiments on our foods, fast foods, you know, things that are, are easy to make do tend to have a lot of sugar, um, and that can lead to a, a increased risk of diabetes. Right, things like soda so, where you're drinking sugar. Yeah, so lots sugar of added water. sugar in our, in our products. Um, and the lack of, you know, easy access to fruits and vegetables makes things like cookies and chips more attractive, right? right? I mean, it's easier to go grab a bag of chips than to, you know, make yourself a whole salad. So, I prefer um, Oreos to chips, but that's, well, that's no, a separate. even worse. So, right, but also other but foods. Also, the lack of, of exercise, right? I mean, a lot of us, you know, now spend time sitting at desks, sitting at computers, sitting in cars, whereas before, you know, hundreds of years ago, we would walk, we would work on farms more, um, and we would just be more active in general. So, that also plays a role. Right. And why does weight gain cause diabetes? Is there a direct relationship or are they just kind of associated? People put on extra weight and their blood sugar goes up. Yeah, so, so not everybody who's overweight or obese uh, develops diabetes, but a very large percentage of people do. And that's because as we develop more fat, 
Um, the fat interferes with the way our bodies are able to metabolize sugar, especially fat that accumulates on our liver or on our other organs. It interferes with, for example, the liver's ability to, to process sugars and to process fats um, and increases our risk for insulin resistance. I see. So the, the more fat you have or the more weight you have or obesity, the more insulin resistance you get. Typically, the, yes. The, the glucose or sugar can't get into the muscle cells and the cells where it's supposed to be. Instead, it goes up in your bloodstream yeah. and then winds up in different organs and damages them. Yeah. So, and in, in, early, um, in early stages of type 2 diabetes, um, it's really in a, in a kind of self-continuing cycle because the sugar is high and so the pancreas tries to make more insulin. So then that sugar is able to get into the cells, but if the individual is not moving around or using all that energy, that energy then gets stored as fat. And so the patient now has more weight on them and has more insulin resistance. And then the pancreas has to work even harder and it's, it's this vicious cycle. And at some, some point, the pancreas just can't keep up with the insulin demand. And so the sugar goes up and up and up in the blood instead of being utilized. Right, so that, that's why there's an epidemic. People, I've read statistics that show people are, are gaining weight. There's, there's yes. an obesity epidemic that goes along with the diabetes Absolutely. epidemic as well. Now, yeah. I see a lot of patients who tell me they're not diabetic, they're pre-diabetic. What, mm -hmm. what does that mean? What is pre-diabetes versus real diabetes? And is, yeah. is that a arbitrary uh, name or, or is there really such a separate entity as pre-diabetes? Um, I mean, that's a great, that's a good question because to some extent it is a sort of arbitrary uh, definition of pre-diabetes. So we define in medical terms pre-diabetes as those individuals that have a hemoglobin A1C um, which is something we can measure in your blood between 5.7 and 6.4 percent. And we classify patients as having diabetes when their A1C is 6.5 percent or higher. Um, we typically aim to maintain our hemoglobin A1C below 7 percent in individuals with diabetes. So those that are 5.7 to 6.4 are classified as having prediabetes. But really it's the same disease process as right. having type 2 diabetes it's just that your risk for developing compli uh, diabetes complications is not high in the pre-diabetic range. Whereas once you get to have a hemoglobin A1C above seven, seven and a half really, um, for the long term, you are more at risk for developing uh, complications of diabetes. So seven, uh, A1C of seven is that cutoff where you're getting into the danger zone. Exactly, so, so we right. set a level of 6.5% as the diagnosis for type 2 diabetes so that we do give people some some room right so that they can bring it down from there and you know they're not going to be at risk for for complications um but before that you know it's it's, it's almost like a warning you know if you keep this right. up you know it's going to get trouble. to the point where you are going to get complications but it's really a spectrum of the same disease right so I'm not an endocrinologist, but I, I think it's a mistake to call it pre-diabetes because I see a lot of patients who have diabetes and many of them say, oh, I don't need to worry, I have pre-diabetes. Right. And every time I see them, they put on more weight, doing less exercise, eating more because I'm pre-diabetic. I don't need to worry about it. Yeah. Um, the time I, to control it is when you're in that pre-stage exactly. and then you don't go into the full stage. Yeah. So, so it is, you know, I think it was developed as a way to warn patients like, hey, heads up, you know, this is coming your way. You're pre-diabetic. Right. Um, but really, you know, referring to it as, as insulin resistance would, would be a more uh, accurate term. Right. So, All right. Yeah. Now, if you lose weight, does your A1C go down? So that depends. Oftentimes it does, um, but really the A1C is a reflection of your average glucose. So, so hemoglobin A1C um, is really a measurement of hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is a protein in our blood that carries oxygen to all of our tissues, and everybody has hemoglobin in their blood. Right. Um, and hemoglobin A1C refers to the percentage of the hemoglobin that has a sugar molecule on it. So if you have a lot of sugar floating around in your blood, the sugar is gonna to bind to the hemoglobin in a concentration dependent manner. The more sugars in your blood, the more hemoglobin is gonna have sugar molecules on it. So when we measure the hemoglobin A1C, it's letting us know the percentage of hemoglobin with sugar on it. 
and that's a direct reflection of your average blood sugar. And because hemoglobin molecules last for about three months, each molecule, it's really an average marker of how much blood, how much blood, how much sugar is in your blood over a three month period. So for example, a hemoglobin A1C correlates with an average blood sugar of about 100, uh, 150 um, grams per deciliter, whereas a hemoglobin A1C of 6% would mean an average blood sugar of about 120 milligrams per deciliter. So it's a way to give patients um, and providers uh, an indication of, of how their blood sugar is doing on average. Right. Now I'm surprised that I would say about a third of my patients who have diabetes or pre-diabetes, they tell me they have that, don't know what their A1C is. Um, is it because they're kind of ignoring it or denying they have diabetes? Or in some cases, patients tell me their doctors don't tell them. They just say, oh, you have pre-diabetes, don't worry about it, you know, walk a little extra. Do you tell all your patients what their A1C is? I do tell my patients what yeah. their what their A1C is, um, but mostly to let them know what their likelihood of developing complications are. So, you know, the higher your A1C, the higher your sugar is on average, and of course, you're you're more likely to develop complications. So, I usually do take the time though to explain to them, like I just did, about what hemoglobin A1C means, so that it means something to them, right? So, just telling somebody, oh, your hemoglobin A1C is seven is like, you know, okay, what am I gonna do with that information? Right. But when you say, you know, your hemoglobin A1C is, is eight, and that means that your average blood sugar is 180, and you know, normal is under 150, then it sort of resonates with them as, oh, I need to, I need to work on that. Right. Or when I tell somebody, um, you know, your hemoglobin A1C is 12, that means that on average, your sugar is running, you know, over 300. What? You know, 300, I mean, Stainless. so I think, you know, when you hear 12, you're like, okay, the difference between 12 and 7 doesn't sound so big, right? But when you hear, oh, my sugar is 300 and it right. should be 100, you know, I think that resonates with, with people a little bit more. What should the fasting so, blood sugar be in a person who doesn't have diabetes? Like if they check their blood in the morning before they eat breakfast? Yeah, so, so the guidelines are to keep it under 125. Um, but I, I'll be honest, I, I move away from, I, I don't recommend finger stick testing in general to my patients. Um, I really prefer to steer patients with diabetes, even pre-diabetes, towards the use of continuous glucose monitors because right. measuring a, a finger stick glucose tells you what your sugar is right this minute, right now. Um, and blood sugar can change super quickly. It can change within 20 minutes. If you get up right now and you go take a hot shower and come back, your blood sugar could have changed by 20, 30 points. So when we ask patients to check their fasting blood sugar, Fasting could be, you know, two hours in the morning from the time they wake up to the time they have, you know, a cup of coffee. If they're commuting or they're eating, you know, it's, it's a long period of time. It's not one specific point in time. And, you know, even the alarm clock ringing can, can change your blood sugar. Not a ton, but enough to be the difference between 115 and 130, which would, you know, put you on, on either side of this cutoff of 125. So I really like to use um, continuous glucose monitors for, for home blood sugar monitoring because it gives you a lot more information. It measures your blood sugar every minute or every five minutes, depending on your advice, throughout the whole day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the number appears on your phone. So the you number appears on your phone, right. so you My can see it. My show me that when yep. I ask them. And, and even better, you can share the data with your provider. So I can do a lot of remote glucose monitoring, which was very helpful during the pandemic when patients didn't want to come out. Right. Um, and we can talk about treatment plans remotely. And I could say, you know, I see last night you had trouble with something, you know, what was going on? What did you eat? What did you I do? See. And, you know, and or, or if a patient, you know, calls me in a panic and says, you know, hey doc, my sugar is, you know, 52, what do I do? Right, I can look at the tracings and see, you know, is this a real 52, has he's been running you know, 52 all day, or, you know, it just, it gives you a lot more information to see the patterns. Um, so with these uh, machines that patients carry, it's, how does that work? They put it, I, the TV show, the commercial show it on their arm. How, do, how does yeah, that work? Yeah, so there's, there's two um, main suppliers of uh, continuous, two brands, two main brands of continuous glucose monitors. Which the most, are they? Yeah, the one is called uh, Libre, it's made by Abbott. Um, the Libre 3 is the newest model. It's the size of two stacked pennies, and it is worn on the back of the arm, and it communicates with the phone, sending a reading every minute uh, by Bluetooth from the, the little sensor to the phone, 
And then, um, you know, as I said, a provider can also see it remotely. It, it will send the data to the cloud. Um, so that's the Abbott Libre. Um, and then there's another, another one uh, made by Dexcom. Uh, Dexcom is, is a little bit bigger. Uh, they're at their seventh version, the Dexcom 7. Um, it's a touch bigger, uh, and it can be worn either on the arm or on the belly, uh, or on the leg, anywhere, anywhere where you have a little bit of, of room to spare. So primarily belly, leg, and, and arm. Um, and it works the same way. It, it communicates with the phone, uh, can integrate with providers. Um, and the nice thing about the Dexcom is for patients with type 1 diabetes, it can also integrate with insulin pumps. So. It's, it's uh, pretty yeah. amazing. Now, yeah. how does that read the, the sugar or the glucose? Is there a little needle in that device? So there's no on? needle, but there is a little tiny little catheter that's about two millimeters in length. And when the sensor is put on, there, there is a needle to insert it. Um, it. It hurts almost nothing. I mean, you know, far less than a, a flu shot or a COVID shot. <coughs> and then the, the catheter resides just right under the skin, as I said, a couple of millimeters. And what it's measuring is the glucose in the fluid between the cells. So it's not measuring blood, it's measuring what we call interstitial fluid. And the blood and the interstitial fluid take about 15 minutes to equilibrate with each other. So it does lag a little bit behind the glucose, behind the, the blood, um, but not in a way that's clinically, clinically too significant. All right, so it's, it's pretty equal to the blood. Yeah. How long can you keep this device on your arm or wherever you put yeah, it? Yeah, 14 days. 14 so, days. So both wow. the Abbott Libre and the Dexcom uh, G7 sensor uh, will last for 14 days. They're completely waterproof. You can shower with them, bathe with them. Um, you, you forget that they're there. You, you don't feel them. Um, and they're, they're really wonderful devices. So that's so. dramatically changed how patients can monitor diabetes yeah. and also you as well. They actually send the data to you and yep. you'll see problems. And I can see exactly what's going on. Um, and I think it also helps patients to be to take more ownership of their condition and their disease and, and be more involved. You know, they can see in real time what's happening with their sugar. So if they if they do eat ice cream or a donut or right. you know even alcohol, you know, an alcoholic beverage, um, they can see, you know, Every, every minute, every 30 minutes, exactly what happens. And I know for myself, when I first started wearing um, a glucose monitor, um, every now and then I would stress eat some jelly beans. And you know, an hour later I would you know, feel terrible, a little nauseous, not terrible, terrible, but you know, just like, oh, why did I do that? You know that feeling that you get when you make bad choices of like, oh, you know, I shouldn't have had that. And what I found is that my sugar would expectedly go way up from the jelly beans but then it would crash down to even, you know, way lower than it was before I ate the jelly beans. And mm -hmm. just such a rapid fall in blood sugar, maybe, you know, 20, 30 minutes from peak to trough. And, you know, then it, it was mindful for me to think like, oh, well, that's why I feel crappy after eating all these jelly beans, because now my sugar has plummeted. And that's so, because the jelly beans trigger a sudden release of insulin from insulin, your pancreas, exactly. which so, drives the blood sugar down. Yep, and it drives it down. It's not that it goes low that makes you feel bad. It's the speed at which it's going low. So because jelly beans are so easy to, to digest, they're just, you know, it's like just drinking sugar. Um, right. You know, so something like, a, you know, a bagel or ice cream is going to take longer to make your sugar rise, but simple sugars are gonna raise your sugar and then they're gonna plummet right afterwards, so, mm. yeah. And you mentioned alcohol. Alcohol raises blood sugar as well? It raises and then lowers. So, so you see a, a spike and then a, a drop. Yeah, because alcohol can trick the body into thinking that it's sugar because the, the shape of alcohol molecules is very similar to sugar. Right. So it gets mistaken for sugar and can lead to a, a delayed um, release of insulin, but then there's no sugar. so the, the actual blood sugar drops. I see. But if yeah. you're drinking wine and, and things like that, you're actually drinking sugar in addition to the alcohol. Yes, right? yes. Especially so drinks. Yes. Yeah, so so cocktails with, with juice and whatnot are, are particularly problematic. Right. So how do we treat this type two diabetes? You mentioned insulin, that's that's been the standard of, of treatment. Why aren't all diabetics, type two diabetics on insulin? Yeah, so I think uh, treating individuals with type 2 diabetes with insulin is completely counterproductive. Because as we talked about, type 2 diabetes is not a problem with insulin production, it's a problem with insulin resistance. 
So their bodies in the early and middle stages of type 2 diabetes is perfectly capable of, of producing insulin. It's just not good at using the insulin. So yes, we can overcome that hump by adding more insulin, but it doesn't really get at the disease process. It doesn't make them any better. So what I tell patients in my office is, you know, let's say I have a glass of red wine, right? And I spill it on your carpet over here, you're gonna have a stain on your carpet. Mm -hmm. So I can go and get another carpet and put it on top, or I can get the detergent, get on my hands and knees and clean up your carpet for you, right? Either way, your, your floor is gonna look fine, right? So giving insulin to patients with type two diabetes is like just putting another carpet on top. It makes the sugars go down, right? Prevents the complications of diabetes, but it doesn't really make the disease any better. If I clean up that stain, then I've fixed your floor. I've restored right. it to its, its previous configuration. So using alternative medications, non-insulin medications, um, can, can help improve the physiology of the individual overall. So the medications that I like to use, um, there's metformin, which is kind of tried and true. Right. Um, that works on the liver uh, to help the liver process, uh, process glucose. Um, and that does help with insulin resistance. So it makes the cells more susceptible to, to insulin. And then some newer medications called SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, so Jardians and Farsiga are the most popular. There's a couple of, of other options as well. Right, I see them advertised on TV all the time. Yeah, so those are great medications for reducing insulin resistance. Um, they help the body to excrete excess sugar into the urine. Um, but for reasons that are, are not well understood, they do seem to reduce inflammation generally in the body, particularly in the kidneys and in the heart. Um, and have shown to have a very, very slight uh, weight loss in some individuals, and they also help with blood pressure as well. So I think through all these mechanisms, they help improve insulin sensitivity, um, and that you know helps individuals with diabetes actually be healthier. Um, and then the, the uh, other medic type of medications that I like to use in patients with type 2 diabetes are the GLP-1 agonists. So those are the once weekly injectable medications, very popular at the moment. Uh, Ozempic, uh, Manjaro, Trulicity is an older version. Uh, um, Bidurian was another brand, I don't think it's used anymore, but it's one of the original uh, GLP-1 agonist medications. Right, so I see ads for Ozempic all the time on TV, that yeah. jingle, I wake up. <laughs> singing the Ozempic jingle, O-O oh, oh, Ozempic, yeah, yeah. which is actually based on an old rock and roll song, but that's a separate <laughs> issue. Um, and then there's uh, Rebelsis, which is an oral form of, yes. of that. Can yes. you tell us what's the difference between Rebelsis and Ozempic and Wagovi? They're, they're all the same So they are all essentially the same thing, exactly. So they're the the generic name for all of them is semaglutide, and that's the active, active ingredient in all of them. Um, Rebelsis is an oral form. Um, it comes in higher doses, and the highest dose of Rebelsis is about as effective as the second dose of Ozempic. So it's quite a bit less powerful. And the reason for that is that it's very hard for the body to absorb semaglutide through the gastrointestinal tract. So when you take Rebelsis, you have to take it first thing in the morning, on an empty stomach and you have to wait at least 30 minutes or more before you eat or drink anything else because it's very, very difficult for the medication to be absorbed into your system. And that's why it's not super powerful. Um, so I'll be honest, I don't use it very often. I do typically steer patients more towards the injectables. Um, they're easier for dosing, easier for compliance, and, and they do work more effectively. And it's just a once a week injection of the Yeah, so once a week injection. It's a tiny needle, so it doesn't hurt. Absolutely tiny. Um, you know, hurts less than, than even putting on the glucose monitor, which as I said, barely hurts it's at like all. Like a mosquito bite. Um, if that. And uh, so Ozempic has a tiny little needle on it. Uh, with Govi, which is also semaglutide, just packaged differently. Um, approved for weight loss, independent of, of diabetes. That's actually a self injector, so you don't even see the needle. It does just pop in and out quickly. Um, it's a you know a one use pen that's disposable, so you use it once and you toss it, and then it's pre filled with the dose. So right. once a week. So I have many patients who have diabetes who are on that, and, and it works great for them. But yeah. I also have a lot of patients now who are using it just purely for weight loss, 
And yeah. I've, I've seen many patients who've lost 40, 50, 70 pounds in, in nine months or so. Is, is that pretty common for Wagovi and Ozempic? Yeah, patients with on uh, Ozempic and Wagovi do typically lose a lot of weight. Um, the weight loss that was associated with these medications, um, you know, was originally a, a side effect of the medication, but right. you know, it's obviously a beneficial side effect, and so you know, we've now steered patients to these medications who can benefit from weight loss. Um, so yeah, so in studies, patients on Ozempic can lose 15 to 20% of their initial body weight in about a year. That's a, you know, a pretty average sort of finding. And like you've seen, I've also seen patients losing up to 30% of their initial body weight in, in you know, six to 12 months. Right. So. How does that work? Is it that they're eating less? Because I asked them, are you eating a lot less? They go, yeah, I'm just not interested in, in food as much, so I'm eating less. But there yeah. seems to be another mechanism because it's not like That's, they're starving or totally well, that, that is food. a uh, They're not totally eliminating food, but they there is a very strong appetite suppressing effect of, of Ozempic and uh, sabagutide, I should say. Um, Ozempic, Wigovi, and, and Rebelsis. Um, it does work on receptors in the brain, in the hunger section of the brain, that do make you feel less hungry. Um, a lot of patients say they have less food anxiety. They're just not thinking about food as much. So, you know, people who are sitting at their desk all morning wondering, you know, what am I going to have for lunch? Where am I going to go? What, what, what time is lunch? All those kind of anxious Results. feelings. Yeah, you know, or, you know. I wonder what we're going to eat for dinner tonight. It just doesn't even, it's a thought that doesn't even occur to them now that they're, you know, taking Ozempic. Um, and it, it, there, it is, you know, well established that there are receptors in the brain for GLP. Um, and these are GLP-1 agonists, so they increase the amount of, of GLP-1. And receptors in the brain respond to it and, and sort of shut down those thoughts, shut down appetite. So that's one of the primary ways that uh, uh, sabagotide leads to weight loss but it also slows gastric emptying so that you feel full with less food. So if you're somebody who typically eats two slices of pizza, now you're eating one or, or two thirds of a slice and you're like, oh, you know, I, you know, kind of full, I don't, you know, or you eat so half I, your sandwich instead of the whole sandwich. So, half a pie from a whole pie. There you go. So, yeah, so, so people do eat less. Um, and then for diabetes, it also helps improve insulin sensitivity and makes the pancreatic release of insulin um, just more efficient in general. It, it changes the timing of insulin release to better match how much glucose is circulating in the blood so that you get a more efficient use of insulin as well. Sounds like a miracle drug. And recently I've seen results from some clinical trials that were published where it also reduces the risk of heart disease and kidney disease. Is that right? That is right, yes. So, so patients are less likely to have heart attacks, less likely to have um, kidney dysfunction and, and develop chronic kidney disease. And unclear why exactly that is, whether that's just a byproduct of weight loss in general or a, you know, an action specific to these, to these medications. So, but either way, a, a welcome, you know, development. Right. So, so if you take Farxiga mm -hmm. and Ozempic, yeah. you're guaranteed to live to like 120 because no strokes, no heart attacks, no kidney disease. Well, not no. You still have to and do your you're part. you're skinny. So you, you do still have to do your part. So one you Exercise a little bit as well. Well, it's, it's not little, right? So I, I do think that a lot of people are, you know, kind of lulled into a false sense of security. Uh, with the GLP-1 um, GLP-1 uh, medications, because they're not they're not going to work forever if people don't do what they need to do. So right. yes, they'll suppress your appetite for the time being. They'll make you feel less hungry, but over time, a lot of our eating habits are exactly that. They're habits. So you know they they are reinforced by our choices, and so you know it's easy to slip into bad habits. Um, so if historically you've been somebody who, you know, late night snacks or somebody who eats their feelings, um, yes, initially when you're on Ozempic, you won't feel so hungry, but over time, you know, if you're not, if you're not careful and mindful and, and doing your part, some stress will, will flow your way, um, and you won't be able to, to overcome it anymore, you know? Um, right. So you do have to do your part to be mindful and you do have to exercise because I've seen now that we've 
use these medications in individuals with type 2 diabetes, that if they're not mindful about their diet and they don't uh, increase their exercise, even with Ozempic, after a couple of years, their diabetes stays well controlled, but the weight does start to slowly, slowly creep back mm. despite being on high doses of, of Ozempic. So, mm. so it's not as much of a mirror. It, it's, it's a great jump start. It's a great motivator and a great booster and a great help to people that you know, think that they're doing everything right and, and may believe that. But I think once you start using a medication like this, it sort of helps you realize where maybe you weren't doing things as well as you thought you were. So, so lifestyle changes are, are still critical and very important. Absolutely. So right. because the, the benefits of these medications, I'm not so sure that they're gonna, you know, be with people for ten years without without any sort of changes. Right. So one of the criticisms I've seen is that once you stop the medication then you gain the weight back and the blood sugar goes up again. But I don't know if that's a, a legitimate criticism because that's true of any medication. If you're on metformin or le let's say you're even on insulin, if yeah. you stop it, your blood sugar is going to go up. So like any other chronic disease, you have to take the medication uh, chronically. Yeah, I think that you know when it comes to obesity, there is a, a very, very large lifestyle component to obesity. And so if you use the time that you're on a medication like Ozempic uh, or Wagovi or, or Manjaro to, to really you know, buckle down and, and establish good habits, I do think that it might be possible to come off of it. If you're starting you know, at, a, at a very large weight where your diet consists of soda for breakfast and McDonald's for lunch and maybe Shake Shack for dinner you know, with an ice cream at the end of the day, and you're not doing any exercise, and now, you know, you start on one of these medications, and you change your diet, and you know, you change your diet to be, you know, a low-fat yogurt for breakfast, and a grilled chicken salad for lunch, and you know, piece of fish and, and broccoli for dinner, and you start right. going to the gym. Um, then yeah, maybe you can come off of it, right? Because now you've made the lifestyle changes that you need to maintain your weight. Right. If you're somebody who's mostly been doing things right then it gets a little dicey, so. Now I've seen uh, rumors that just about every Hollywood celebrity is on Ozempic or Wigovi trying, yeah. trying to lose weight. Um, but what happens if you don't have diabetes and you take these drugs? Is your blood sugar going to fall below what's a normal level? Yeah, so typically no, because the way Ozempic and, um, and Wigovi and Manjaro, the way these medications work to improve your blood sugar is they reduce the peaks of blood glucose that you get after eating. So if you're eating less, it's not likely to make your glucose fall, mm. um, but it will prevent it from rising. So that's nice. typically how it helps people with diabetes. Right. So, now, some of my patients told me that they had bad side effects from it. And I only, only have a small sample. You have a lot more patients. Yeah. What percentage of patients have to go off the Ozempic or Wagovi because of bad side effects, and what are those side effects? So very few of my patients uh, discontinue the medication because they can't handle the side effects. I think a really important part of starting patients on these medications is, is, teaching, is telling them, informing them what to expect. So I would say about 30 to 50% of patients who start the medication have some side effects. They feel mm. something that they don't like um, typically nausea, constipation, um, occasionally abdominal cramping, but the, the most common um, is nausea and constipation. Um, but almost all individuals are able to overcome that in the first two to three weeks of, of using the medication. So I always let patients know that about a day after their first injection, maybe you know 18 to 24 hours later, they probably will feel some nausea um, I usually describe it as a motion sickness type feeling. Mm. So you're, you know, going about your day and all of a sudden you feel like, whew, I really, you know, that, you know, was a sharp turn or, or you know, right. I'm on a boat, something like that. Um, they may throw up once or twice. Um, it's not so common to have excessive vomiting for, you know, more than one, you know, one or two episodes of vomiting. Um, but it can happen and that's not super uncommon. Um, 
And then usually the nausea is relatively short lived, you know, half an hour or so. Might come back later in the day, might come back three times in the day. And that usually lasts about three to four days the first week that you do the injection. The second week, it's about two to three days. The third week, it's one day. And by the fourth week, you know, almost all patients in my practice are, are okay if they're going to be okay. So um, if you can get through the first month, you're, you're pretty set. Generally speaking, people are, are fine. I think a mistake that some, some providers and individuals make is starting at anything other than the lowest dose. So I think a lot of people are, you know, kind of excited to get started and, you know, they feel like, oh, just, you know, just give me a big dose right off, off the bat. You know, I can handle it. And right. you really can't handle it, you know, because it, it does take some getting used to. And, you know, going slow and steady is really, really the better way to go. Now, there are individuals that really never overcome the nausea associated with Ozempic, but do just fine with Manjaro. And the reverse is true as well. So I've certainly had patients who, you know, really never got past that initial hurdle for one, but switched to the other and were completely fine. So, yeah. So you, you've had to switch some patients. I have. Or, so it's rare. Um, and there's, there's very few patients in my practice, I would say fewer than 5%, that can't tolerate any of them. So. Have you seen any very serious side effects or complications from Ozempic or Mujaro or Lagovi or, or not? I fortunately have been very blessed not to have my patients have complications, but right. it certainly does happen. Um, I've seen you know patients in the hospital um, who have had complications. Uh, pancreatitis is a big one. Um, but it's rare. It's super, super rare. It's a serious complication, but rare. But rare and manageable. I mean, right. you have to deal with it. You can't ignore it. Um, but it is manageable. Um, but quite a number of patients have side effects from rapid weight loss. So they will, you know, advance their, their dose too quickly um, and lose a lot of weight in a very short amount of time. And that can lead to kidney stone development, gallstone development, um, which can be pretty serious side effects. Um, they can develop nutritional deficiencies because they're just not eating the right stuff. Um, they're not getting enough nutrients in them. Uh, hair loss is not, not an uncommon effect of rapid weight loss. And so patients will say, you know, I'm, I'm losing hair, and we'll have to have a discussion about how that's not because of the Ozempic per se, but that is a, a side effect of weight loss. Weight loss. So. Now, is the weight loss all fat, or is it some muscle as well? It's actually predominantly muscle. Really? So. Mostly? Well, that's not a good thing, is it? It's not a great thing, no. So I really stress with patients that when they start on a weight loss plan, especially with these medications, that strength training and exercise has to be a part of the plan because they will start to feel weak, tired, um, fatigued from, from the muscle loss. So that is a, a, a big concern uh, when using these medications, especially in more mature or elderly individuals that have a hard time building up muscles. You know, as we get older, it gets harder to, to build muscle. Right. Um, so in the elderly especially, uh, muscle loss is, is a problem, yeah. What about, I've been reading lately, black market or counterfeit Ozempic, and actually the FDA came out with a warning, warning people not to buy these products that are made by some pharmacy. What do you know about yeah, that? Yeah, so, so that typically that's gonna be uh, compounding pharmacies, and you know, uh, Ozempic, Wagovia, and Manjaro are all on patent, right. so the exact formula that is in those pens is proprietary, that's owned by the company, and it's, it's not public knowledge. The active ingredient, semaglutide, is a chemical that, you know, theoretically you can buy at a chemical store, um, or I assume. Um, so if you are a chemist and you think that you know how to dilute semaglutide into a formula that's fit for injection into human beings, then a compounding pharmacy can certainly attempt to recreate Ozempic. Um, but it's not going to be the exact thing, and it's not going to be FDA approved. And so you really don't know what you're getting. Um, and you do, it hasn't been tested. And it's essentially an individual's or a chemist's best guess about what Ozempic is. So I tell patients it's like you know buying counterfeit anything. So some counterfeit objects are spectacular. You can't tell the difference. Um, you know, you can buy a, uh, 
I don't know, a, a Chanel bag at, you know, the Chanel store and you know you're getting a legit bag or you can go to Canal Street and, you know, some, some Chanel bags are great, but some of them are going to fall apart after, you know, two I, days. I know a really good place. I mean, so, so, okay. You wouldn't be so, able to tell the difference. Right. But, you know, when it comes to something you're going to inject into your body. It's totally different. You know, I, uh, I'd be a little hesitant. You know, a bag, no big deal. Yeah, I'd be so, very hesitant. Um, it might not be sterile. You could get an infection. It might have other ingredients. And now they're putting fentanyl on everything. Stay away from yep, fake Yep, so I do not recommend compounded medications under any circumstances. I, I know they're pricey. I know they're hard to get. Um, and it's, it's a problem for individuals who do really need these medications and can't afford them or can't get them. Um, but I think resorting to, to compounding is not the way to go. So. Do you have patients coming to see you who don't have diabetes, don't look overweight, their BMI is pretty good, and they want a prescription for Ozempic because they want to take off another 10 or 15 pounds and what do you do with those patients yeah it's 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 difficult right because on the one hand um we don't want to promote uh body dysmorphia or unhealthy eating or you know uh, body shaming issues like that and on the other hand we do want to be sensitive to the concerns of our patients and understand where they're coming from um, but also realize that our society, for better or worse, seems to accept, you know, using medicine for cosmetic purposes, right? So, you know, if somebody goes to the plastic surgeon and says, you know, I want a new nose, don't um, that, right? we don't really think twice about it or we don't judge them. We don't, I mean, maybe we privately judge them, but as a society, you know, we don't judge them and, and we've accepted that that's an okay use of, of medical ability and, and medical uh, tools. That's a great analogy, so, I like that. So I feel like in some ways it's it's very similar and just as a plastic surgeon explains to their, their patient who wants, you know, rhinoplasty that they look great, their nose is fine, but you know, it's bothering them. It's, you know, for whatever reason, their, their nose still works just fine, right? But okay, you know, they, they get a rhinoplasty. Um, and our society accepts that. So I think it's very similar when individuals who are not overweight are, are looking for these medications. So I think as providers, we have to be very careful. Um, and of course we never, you know, first do no harm. So we do have to be sure that, you know, the patient knows what they're doing, that they understand the risks and the benefits and, you know, understand what their motivations are in, in pursuing this type of treatment. Hmm. Is there an age uh, below which you, you won't prescribe the, these drugs, assuming they're not diabetic, just for weight loss? There's some controversy. I mean, in, in my practice, I, I see adults. The only, so so I see adults. 18. I mean, the, the youngest, yeah, the youngest I see in my office is about 16, 17. So, um, so I don't really have any experience with uh, the use of these medications in, in a really pediatric population. Right, but they're okay so. to use in people in their upper teens? I think the biggest issue with uh, young people in, the, in their teens and early 20s is, is the end game, right? So are they gonna stay on it forever? Um, especially in women, they're not approved in pregnancy. We don't know what the effects are in a fetus. Right. So a young woman, uh, you know, teenager, early 20s, even late twenties, uh, you know, who hasn't started her family yet, um, if that's on her agenda going forward, um, what's the plan here? You know, how are we going to come off of it? What's going to happen? Um, you know, what do you do with a, a teenager who's about to head off to university or to college? And you know, that's a time full of changes. So, are they really in the best position to establish good habits? What's what's going to happen? So, a lot of um, factors to so there's a you know, you really have to take it on a on a case by case basis. I wouldn't say there's you know, a hard age limit of, you know, 18, 17, 16, um, where it becomes appropriate or, or inappropriate. It's more about, you know, understanding, you know, the individual and their life and, you know, making sure that they know what they're getting into. Right. I'll go back to insulin for a minute. We yeah. you mentioned earlier that insulin is used for type 1 diabetes. Yes. That, that's the drug of choice. And some type 2 diabetics need insulin as well. Uh, there's been a controversy about the pricing of insulin. Insulin insulin's been around a long, long time, but the mm -hmm. prices for some reason went way up, and there's been a lot of fighting between governments and the companies. What's going on with, with insulin and pricing? 
Yeah, so, so as you mentioned, insulin has been around for a long time, um, but older insulins don't work as well as newer insulins. So we now have many different types of insulin. So there's uh, long-acting insulins and shorter-acting insulins. So long-acting insulins are typically administered once a day. And it's sort of a background level of insulin that even if you don't eat, keeps your sugar in check. And then we have short-acting insulins for when you eat um, to keep your sugar you know, appropriate in response to the meal. So those, those are newer insulins, um, and they work better than the older insulins, which were sort of in between. They would work for you know, eight to 12 hours, which is really not super helpful, right? Because you want a background insulin that's gonna work the whole day, and then you want a short-acting insulin that's only right. gonna work for you know, a couple of hours after, after your meal. Um, so these newer insulins, uh, by and large, are still on patent, and so they, they can be you know, priced pretty high, and they can be very expensive for, for certain individuals to afford. So uh, recently, the, gover the government enacted some legislation to cap the price of all insulins at $35 a month. And I think that this is great for individuals with type 1 diabetes who are completely dependent on insulin the way you and I are dependent on oxygen, right. so or almost, almost yeah, thereabout. Um, but for most individuals with type 2 diabetes, there's very few individuals with type 2 diabetes that have such advanced disease that they actually require insulin. So if you've had uncontrolled type 2 diabetes for, for a long time, your pancreas does eventually become unable to, to make enough insulin. Um, and those are the individuals that, that do need insulin. But for most people uh, with type 2 diabetes, they're not at that stage yet. And so using these newer medications will actually help them prevent developing the need for insulin. The issue with the pricing is that if you have a choice of paying a copay of $200 a month for Jardians or $35 a month for insulin and you're on a, a limited income, um, what are you going to choose, right? You're going to choose insulin. Right. And if you're telling your provider, well, I can't afford the Jardians, your provider is going to say, well, I want you to you know, have medication, so I'll write you for the insulin. Um, and so I think this government cap is going to funnel individuals who would benefit from SGLT2s and GLP1s into using insulin instead because of the price differential. And I think that that is really counterproductive in the long run to, to their health as well as to the treatment of, of type 2 diabetes. Mm. So, so it would be better to just lower the price on the Jardians. And the, and the GLP-1s, make those right. more, more affordable uh, rather than capping the price of insulin. Um, it's tricky though, right? Because patients with type 1 require insulin. Right. So what are you going to do? Say it's capped for some and not for others? I mean, I, you know, I don't know. So. Yeah, that'll be so, you filling right? out and that's, more you know, forms. Yeah, I mean, and that's, uh, you know, insurance companies to, to regulate. And it's tough. It's a tough industry. Right. You mentioned so, earlier about an insulin pump. Can you explain what that is? Who uses that? Who benefits from it? And how it can interface with the glucose monitors? Yeah, so uh, it's primarily used by individuals with type 1 diabetes, although individuals with type 2 who need insulin would certainly benefit as well. Um, and insulin pumps are, are small devices um, that you fill with three days worth of insulin. So you figure out or you estimate approximately how much insulin you're going to need for about three days. And then when you apply it to your skin, um, it does have also a little catheter. And the pump is programmed to release a small amount of insulin every few minutes running in the background. And then the patient can interface with the pump and let the pump know when they're going to eat, how much they're going to eat. And the pump will calculate how much insulin they need based on parameters that have been put in there by the provider, as well as what the patient is telling the pump uh, they plan to eat at, at that time. So the pump will calculate how much insulin is needed and will deliver it um, without the patient having to actually inject insulin every time they wanna eat. So it really saves on injection and also allows for uh, more individualized dosing. So because the pumps can deliver you know, tenths of a unit as opposed to whole units, which we typically do with, with the uh, injections. So it keeps so. your blood sugars pretty level, prevents uh, spikes. That's the, that's the idea. And now with uh, newer, what we call closed loop systems, 
um, that do integrate with continuous glucose monitors, the readings from the glucose monitor can communicate directly with the pump, which can integrate that information through you know, various proprietary algorithms and essentially have you know, AI uh, decide how much in insulin the, the individual needs at any moment in time. It's almost so, like a mechanical external pancreas. Exactly. Yes, that's what it's called, an artificial pancreas system. So, wow. that's, are there companies yeah. that are making that now? Is it available? Yeah, there's a few yeah. of them. Uh, there's one that's made by Medtronic. Um, there's another company, Tandem, the Tandem Insulin Pump, and a third company called Omnipod. Those are the three main players. There is a, um, a new pump, uh, it's a bionic pump that actually has, um, it's the newest one. Uh, I haven't personally used it yet. Um, that is, is very simple and all you have to do is tell it your weight and it has an algorithm built in um, and you just go. So, yeah. That's pretty amazing. What about, I've been reading about pancreas transplants for patients with type 1 diabetes. Where is that? It's definitely, it's definitely emerging. Um, you know, all sorts of transplants have various complications with rejection of, of the tissue and the need for lifelong immunosuppressives. Um, but it's certainly an, an emerging area. And I think once we get a little better and, and more efficient at figuring out how to do it, it'll definitely be a, a great treatment. There's also stem cell treatments that are emerging where um, you know, we try to recreate a patient's own pancreas from their stem cells. Um, I think for type one, that's really the way of the future. Right, stem cells are, you can make any, just about any organ you want. Yeah. So it's, I think in the next five or 10 years. Yeah. Where is uh, the management of diabetes heading in the next five or 10 years, you think? Well, I think with, uh, with type one, it's certainly heading towards, um, you know, better AI to, for, to establish better closed loop systems that, as you said, are essentially an artificial pancreas. Um, and emerging uh, stem cell treatments. There's also a very new treatment, it's been out about a year, um, that's a monoclonal antibody treatment that attacks the antibodies um, and preserves pancreatic function. So at the moment, it's, it's approved for uh, patients that have um, evidence of autoimmunity, so antibodies that are, are going to be attacking their pancreas, um, but still have some remaining pancreatic function. So they're not there yet, really. They're not diabetic yet, but they are well on their way to becoming type one diabetics. So this treatment called T-Zealed, um, it's a, an infusion, it's given once a day for 14 days, and that's been shown to delay the onset of type one diabetes uh, by two years at least. And I think there's more research being done on whether repeated treatments might help delay it even more. And I think that's, you know, a very cool emerging treatment for prevention of type 1 diabetes. Sounds uh, fascinating. Yeah. Just, just to close, uh, how often should people be checking their blood sugars and at what age should they start checking that to see if they have or don't have diabetes? Yeah, so you know, I recommend that most individuals uh, have their A1C checked um, at least once a year with their, uh, with their primary care provider. Um, I think if you're overweight or obese, you'd certainly want to start earlier. Um, but I, I would think starting around 40, 45 is probably going to be the right Good age idea. for for more, more, you know, for people who are our normal weight. Um, if you're a smoker or you're overweight or a, a big drinker or other kind of poor lifestyle habits, uh, you probably want to start earlier, maybe as early as as 25 even, mm -hmm. um, to get your A1C checked. But you know, there's really I really think that continuous glucose monitors are going to go the way of uh, step counters and pedometers right. where, you know, individuals uh, can already use them, you know, just by choice. So there's many companies on, on, the, in, on the internet, uh, Calibrate, NutriSense, which will sell you a glucose monitor, um, show you how to put it on, and we'll give you a, a report of your data. So I know many athletes are, are using continuous glucose monitors to get information to help their performance, to see how, how their blood sugar moves and, and relates to their athletic performance. So I think that blood sugar monitoring is definitely going to be something we're going to be seeing more of by individuals without diabetes going forward. 
Apple, so, this is a great opportunity. Your next watch should have a glucose monitor built into it, right? There, there are some emerging uh, non-invasive um, mechanisms. There are some smart watches out there, actually. They're not very good, to, to be honest. They're not great. Not um, they're not so accurate, but it's, it's definitely a, a hot area. Yeah. So. This has been uh, very fascinating. I learned a lot about uh, diabetes, things I thought I knew but, but didn't know. So now yeah. I, I think uh, our audience loved this as well. Everybody out there is now a diabetes uh, expert. Excellent. Yeah, Excellent. I'd like to thank you very much for taking yeah, time pleasure. and coming today. Thank this, you for having me here. Yeah, this, this was uh, really awesome. And I, I think uh, everybody's going to watch it and really enjoy it. Great. And if you do enjoy it, please, again, uh, click the like button button and the repost button and please send your comments so we can make even better programs on the Dr. Podcast show. Thank you.